This is the U.S. Coast Guard. 35,000 men and women across the country and around the world, serving in America's smallest and most unique military force, always ready to protect coastal waters, enforce the laws, and save the lives of those in peril on the seas. They've been doing it for more than 200 years. Drug interdiction, fisheries protection, pollution control, search and rescue sea, in the air, 24 hours a day. Every unit with its own special job. Every unit with its own special story. Columbia River Bar between Oregon and Washington. Some of the roughest sea conditions in North America. Definitely has a personality of its own. <laughs> An evil one. Men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard battle the bar every day of the year, saving ships, saving lives. When you hear someone calling a mayday, and you can just hear the fear in their voice. And you're going out there to help them. You're their only chance. This is the story of the men and women of Cape Disappointment who call themselves the Guardians of the Graveyard. The Cape Disappointment Light, overlooking the Columbia River Bar and a number of small fishing ports. It's 5 a.m. Mark Charlton is skipper of Sea Pride, a 40-foot crabber, on his way out across the bar. I spent the last four or five days in a row out there with uh, gale forced easterly winds, which makes the river not very nice. I ache all over. <laughs> and so is my crew. Mark and his two crew members, Randy Bushnell and Gordy Olson, must fish these waters no matter what the weather. Economic survival depends on it. You have to respect the ocean. Swells could be anywhere from six, eight foot to maybe 40 foot at times with big storms. Wind can vary all the way up to 80 to 90 knots. You're facing death every time you go out there. It's fishing boats that most often need Coast Guard assistance. The Columbia River Bar is one of the most treacherous most dangerous bars in the world. There's not a fishing community along the coast that hasn't lost men and boats to the hungry waters of the bar. Well, I've seen it in the past where you couldn't pass the bar because it would be white all the way across. You'd either be stuck in the ocean or go home and wait until the next day. Coast Guard, Coast Guard, this is Careless Navigator. Careless Navigator, keep swimming over. I'm dragging my anchor on, on my buoy seven. Can I have the number of people you have on board over? Yeah, I got four. Oh, D laid off. Party sir, at this time I'd like to have all your crew members put a life jacket or survival suit on over. We just lost a man overboard, he's a buoy seven. Uh, okay. going into I'm gonna hit Sarlon, pack the boat crew to the boats. Now, boat to serve. First boat crew, let him more life boat. Prime. Second boat crew, let him more life boat. Four, 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 three. Now, boat to serve. First boat crew, let him more life boat. Prime. Second boat crew, let him more life boat. Four, 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 three. For the 40 men and women assigned to Coast Guard Station Cape Disappointment, the action to the search and rescue, or SAR alarm, is automatic and instantaneous. It's for this that they've been trained. Whether it's a drill or a real SAR case, the response is just the same. Get out to sea as fast as possible. Minutes count when lives are at stake. 
Shark ties up! For the Coast Guard crews of Cape D, average time from SAR alarm to launch of a motor lifeboat is less than three minutes. Too often, the call is for real. It's January 21st, 1990. 20 foot seas and winds of up to 25 miles an hour make sea conditions a nightmare. Although the bar's been closed to navigation, one fishing boat, the Gambler, has tried to make it across with tragic results. Eight of the nine people on board are swept overboard. The ninth is trapped below when the Gambler capsizes. He survives in an air pocket for almost 20 minutes before the pounding surf starts tearing the overturned boat apart. He is rescued by the Coast Guard. When the Coast Guard 44-foot motor lifeboat arrives, only two survivors can be spotted in the surf. The Coast Guard coxswain tries to get in close to the wreck of a gambler while Coast Guard and other rescue workers search for survivors that may still be alive in the breakers. While 44-footers are designed to survive a 360-degree rollover, the Coast Guard boat crew are now in serious danger. Of the nine people aboard Gambler, just two will be rescued by the Coast Guard. The body of a third is found later, washed up on the rocks. The rest just vanish, swallowed by the waves. Conditions on the Columbia River bar caused three sinkings alone in 1994. Today, there's no tragedy on the Columbia River bar. This was only a drill for Cape D. There can be weeks when no one gets into trouble. For coasties like Jay Thomas and boats coxswain Jeff Ruggieri, it's the rescues that make all the danger worthwhile. Every time you hear the throw alarm, you just kind of send a chill through your spine and get your adrenaline pumping immediately. Just not knowing what you're going into. I'd pull a guy out of the water, watch the boat capsize where it gets the age jetty. Probably one of the most scariest, I would think. We almost capsized. Uh, two waves. It's like when you're in the middle of a danger situation, you don't, a lot of times you, you don't think about that, you think about doing the job. And uh, it's after the fact, it's what gets you. It really, really doesn't help out when you get seasick. When Jeff and his colleagues aren't performing a rescue or training for the next one, they're busy maintaining, repairing, and servicing their boats and the rescue equipment on board. Now we gotta clean it. <laughs> Who's gonna wash them when we get back? Theirs is a life dictated by reaction, reaction to crisis. Two boat crews are on standby at all times, around the clock, ready to launch within three minutes. Jeff and his crewmates stand a 48-hour watch. For two days and two nights, they won't leave the base. If there are a lot of calls, they won't get much sleep yeah. either. Yeah. Yeah. You, you spend a lot of hours here, and your family's basically the guys you work with. So Especially even the married, work. even the married people, I mean, that's your family. I mean, we're here the majority of the time. You ready? You want to play for quarters? You want to play for quarters <laughs> yeah. tomorrow? We'll for you stand quarters. up. Right. Tuesday, you guys have to stand up and say what we had to do last year. We lost the big blow because of SARS. Right. That's right. That's right. Okay, we're cool with that. All right. All right, zeros. For Jeff and all yeah, boat crews, any SAR cases in winter are usually tough, hard, and dangerous. I'm pretty spontaneous about, about stuff that I do, and it doesn't bother me until after the fact. I did a particular case where I watched the boat capsize. I watched two people go in the water. My crew member couldn't get the guy on board, so I had to leave the wheel. The swells were building. We made it up the crest of one, and it broke underneath us. And then the second one almost capsized us. 
it didn't bother me at all until we moored back up at, at, at the station and the guy got off the boat and the, the ambulance came, picked him up, and I got real nauseous and stick to my stomach. I, I almost threw up. You know, I had so much adrenaline, I guess. And then I thought about it for a while and I said, man, you know, was that stupid or did I do good? Uh, hey, Bernie, please. I'm going to get it over. Yes! 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 Woo! What are you going to say now? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Coast Guard crews and fishermen face the same reality. Their jobs depend on going out no matter how bad the weather. Every day you uh, get out and get in over Columbia River Bar and make it back home, you cheat to death, in my opinion. On the fishing boat Sea Pride, Mark Charlton and his crew are frequently out for days at a time. With competition up and crab stocks down, no fisherman can afford to wait around for calm seas. What used to be Go down, take a look at the bar. Well, boys, it's too rough. There's always tomorrow. Is well, the big boys are out there. We have to get out there, too. We have to get our piece of the pie because it only lasts four to six weeks anymore. So it pushes a small guy to take chances they normally wouldn't take. And so it's fishermen who most often get into trouble on the bar. Coast Guard Air Station Astoria across the Columbia River from Cape Disappointment. A rescue helicopter is always waiting on the flight line. Along with the two pilots and flight mechanic, a key member of the helo crew is the rescue swimmer, trained to jump into waves as high as 20 feet. The rescue swimmer will carry rafts, medical supplies, anything that may be needed to bring a survivor out of the water. Randy Bushnell on the Sea Pride has good reason to be grateful to a rescue swimmer from the airbase. My dad and I was out fishing and it was a real nasty day. We was going up and down all of a sudden kabam. I don't know if we hit something or if the bottom just fell out or what, but uh, I got a mayday off and my dad was outside getting the lifeboat down off the top of the house. And he says, hurry up and get out of there for boat saying she's gonna go with it. And he says, okay, get in the lifeboat. And I said, no way, I'm not getting off this boat. <laughs> and he says, get in that lifeboat. Yeah, it took about five minutes and the boat was gone. The Coast Guard got there really fast. The uh, helicopter came out there and lowered the basket to pick us up, you know, and. They did a real good job. <laughs> Glad to see him. <laughs> the rescue swimmer's job is to get survivors into the basket and up into the helicopter. But helicopters don't carry much extra weight. If there are several survivors, rescue swimmers may have to remain in the water for hours until someone can get back to pick them up. This too goes with the territory. But at night and in heavy seas, such a wait seems like forever. Helicopters from Astoria and lifeboats from Cape D practice together day and night. Although a helo's speed means it's often first on the scene, successful rescue will often depend on split-second timing between the two. For Cape D's coxswains, bar conditions are so bad that even training is dangerous. But the real thing can be much, much worse. It's midnight at Cape Disappointment. For once, the seas are calm, bar conditions good. 
Good evening, Coast Guard Station Cape Disappointment, but I ask a favor speaking, how may I help you? And do you have a brief description of it? The report's just in. A large, unidentified object has been sighted floating out onto the bar. No emergency yet, but it needs to be checked out quickly. It's 30 degrees right now, and then the wind's probably blowing 20 knots, so the wind chill's probably around 20. So I don't think it's going to be the best. Where, where is it at, sir? Do you know the location? One boat is sent out to investigate. Jeff's crew will provide backup. I think every job that you're going to go to is going to be different. At night, you can't see, so you rely a lot on the last light bar report and the weather reports. Biggest fear, not coming back. You never know what you're going into. It's really bad. Uh, they get beat up pretty bad out there. I mean, I admire them for doing that stuff every day. I just provide main support up here by feeding them when they come in and making sure they have a hot meal and that, uh, that they like it. Back at the station, Cook Terry Allison will be up the rest of the night. There'll be plenty of hot food and coffee waiting for Jeff and his crew when they return. You guys have to go out there and do a search and rescue. And usually that, that means I have to stay up late. But when I'm on duty, I'm on duty 24 hours, so they can call me at any time. It's great when you get back in and have somebody say thank you. I mean, that's, that's the most rewarding thing anybody can do for me. When you I go mean, out and do your job and you do it correctly, and you say, I mean, you end up saving somebody or helping someone. That's about, that's, that's the most rewarding thing. Sitting at the dock's no fun. I mean, it's, it's no fun whatsoever. But when you get yeah, called out at 2 or 3 in the morning yeah. and then you're half awake and the, um, <laughs> you're going, oh, no, where have I done? The monotony goes away real quick. One mystery is resolved. The unidentified sighting is a large boathouse adrift on the bar. It's a hazard to navigation and must be towed to shore. But other questions remain. Is anyone aboard? How and why is it adrift? Looks like it's a big log under a big tower. There's a lawn chair in there. Oh, is that funny? Oh, there is a lawn chair sitting there. Look at that. Pretty strange to see a house float down the river. Uh, no one reported it until it got out here to the bar. So, um, from the nearest landing besides Owaka, you're looking at at least at least six, six or eight miles before anybody reported it. Kind of interesting. First time it's ever happened to me. It's freezing. Wind chill makes it seem even colder. Jeff and his team must now search the boathouse to make sure it's empty. I got on and it went down and back up, and I was going, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll go swimming. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was going to float or not. And then the decking was pretty, pretty <coughs> rotten, and I fell through once. It was exciting. <laughs> and it's cold. And it was ice. And it's dark. Mission accomplished. The boathouse is safely tied off. Jeff's crew now have a good, if unusual, rescue story for their shipmates in the morning. <laughs> I've towed in docks before, but not boathouses like this. That's a pretty big boathouse. It was definitely a different kind of case. Commander's briefing, or quarters, takes place at 7.30 each morning. Terry and Jay must now honor last night's bet. I'll do the talking. I can't do it, but OK, you I'll do the talking. I'll do the talking. OK, and we'll both just stand up and just tell yeah, them. Because it, last time when you and Bernie did your announcement <laughs> with the pool yeah, thing, you could, you, yeah, you yeah. could yeah. understand what you were saying. Our minimum temperature this morning was 28 degrees. And the present temperature is 33.6. The visual bar condition this morning was uh, the bar
bar was pretty flat like yesterday, kind of one to three. We'll get the, the boat report here shortly. Anybody have anything else for all hands? Yeah, we've got something. This weekend, uh, Terry and I played Jeff and Bernie at ping pong, and we lost because we're sorry. We're sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's getting light, and there's been no new excitement since the drifting boathouse. The leaf coxswain, Sean McDonald, readies the 52-foot triumph for sea. Cape D needs a morning bar report. The best way to check it is to get out on it. Coast Guard Station Cape Disappointment, or Life of Triumph. The bar has its own personality. You can't guess it. It changes constantly. That's one of the things that really surprised me when I came here. You can go out here in the summer on a day when it's like glass, but in the wintertime, you have 20 to 25 foot waves coming in, one right after the other, and it really makes you wonder if it's the same bar that you're on. You don't win against the bar. The day you think you won is when something's going to go wrong. Surf belts and helmets, guys. We got surf. Every morning, a visual check of the bar is also made from the tower beside the old lighthouse, looking down on Cape Disappointment and the Columbia River Bar. From jetty to jetty, that's my main concern. And mostly just the main channel, because that's where the bar boat goes out to. Most of the time during the winter, they're not out with any other vessels, so they're just by themselves, so we just keep an eye on them to make sure nothing happens. do is we go out to uh, the turn buoy number eight, which is uh, even with the tips of the jetties, and we get a, what's called a bar report. It's uh, actual on-scene sea conditions. So uh, that's what we do. We go out there and we see how much we're getting thrown about, report it back to the station, and they log the info. Okay, it's going to get a little wet. You just can't tell. It's not in any book or computer model or anything. Every day is a different day on the bar. Every time you go out, it's different. It just changes so rapidly, and you got to keep your head on a swivel, as they say. The motto of the Coast Guard is Semper Paratus, always ready, for a SAR case can come at any time. January 7th, 1995, by 15 a.m. The fishing vessel Coolidge 2 calls the Coast Guard for help. 20 miles from shore, she is taking on water and her crew know that they're in trouble. By 7.20 a.m., the Coast Guard is already on the scene. Pumps are put on board to help the fishing vessel stay afloat. By 9 o'clock, Coolidge 2's captain reports that the flooding is getting worse the vessel must be abandoned. With Coolidge 2's decks sinking lower and lower into the water, the Coast Guard's task is not easy. Sea conditions are bad and getting worse. The coxswain on board the 44-footer can only bring two of the three men safely aboard before he has to back away. The captain remains on Coolidge too. The swells pick up. The coxswain on the 44 goes in for another try. It takes precise and difficult maneuvering before the fishing vessel's skipper can be taken off. two sinks shortly afterwards. On the fishing vessel Seapide, the only problem today is the growing exhaustion. Fishing goes on around the clock. The bar is always dangerous, 
even when quiet. Lockman Gordy has seen too many friends and family die to ever trust the sea that gives him a living. In the wintertime, it's a gamble when you go. It's probably the toughest bar to get across. There's other bars that are real rough, but they're not as long as this one. This is about four or five miles of rough bar that you got to get across. There's been times when I've come across the bar that I put on my survival suit and uh, we took it off and we got across. Yeah, you bet. If you're not afraid, there's something wrong with you. I guess my dad was pretty young. I guess he was 19 or 20 or something like that when his dad died out there. A ship cut their boat in half. They were shark fishing at the time. And uh, he was a young man. I think he was only 45 or something like that when he died. And then my dad, eight years ago, 1988, I guess it was, his uh, boat, McKinley, was cut in half by a car carrier. And uh, he was in the water for about 45 minutes to an hour. They got him to the hospital with uh, vital signs, but after that, he didn't make it. He uh, died of hypothermia, and that was in August when the weather was supposed to be good, so uh, the water's still plenty cold out here. The Coast Guard did a real good job. I very seldom have ever heard of the Coast Guard doing a bad job. They usually, they usually do a real good job. Young kids, you know, you just, uh, they don't have any fear. They just go, so. Oh. Angie loved it member of Jeff's boat crew is a single parent, balancing raising her six-year-old daughter Don't with her there. Coast Guard career. Coast Guard men and women and their families are a close-knit group. They're so isolated at Cape D they rely on each other heavily for support and company. Jeff and Angie become detectives. They try and find out what the boathouse was doing adrift on the bar and who it belongs to. Hold on, Bernie. There's like no traction on the Jeff is just 26. Like most Coasties, he's very young for the responsibilities he carries. As a coxswain, you're responsible for the people that are on your boat. Yeah. Uh, you're in charge when you're on that boat. There's no name on this one. All right, uh, see about those, those floats over there. You want me to go over there? Yeah. If I go in the water, just get me out fairly quickly. No problem. All right. There's a book. Paperback. Huh? He likes westerns. All right. I hope his name's on this. Well, what, what, what ship? That's yeah, the, you're right at the edge. There used to be an old saying in the Coast Guard, they have to go out, but they don't have to come back. That's not true at all. It's still pretty stable. Okay. It's still yeah. more stable in here than it does out there. Yeah. It's yeah. your crew members, the crew that you're going to save, and then the safety of your vessel. That's a real important part of my job. I don't know. Okay, 516. Cape Disappointment is home to more than just the boat station. Here too is the National Motor Lifeboat School, where Coast Guard instructor Mark Davenport and his colleagues train rescue boat coxswains to survive the worst surf conditions available. Students come from Coast Guard stations across America to take this special two-week course. Bad weather's a requirement. They're sent home if conditions are too good. Once they've learned to handle a boat on this bar, they can handle one anywhere. This is Tuesday of week two, the two-week class. Normally, we look at graduating on Friday. Unfortunately, we haven't had the weather conditions that we like. Uh, the worse it is, the better it is for us. These guys have come 3,000 miles in some cases, and they may only get one opportunity to go to this school. Yeah. And we're going to do everything we can to, to get them all the way through. What we're going to go out to do today is we're going to go out and we're going to practice station keeping, holding position with a disabled vessel. He'd be taking on water, he'd be getting ready to sink. And what we're hoping to do is give him a great deal more confidence. We're going to give him an edge that they may not be able to get at their unit because they don't have the weather conditions.
This may be just training, but conditions on the Columbia River bar are extremely hazardous. It's going through your mind right now. I'm ready on deck. I'm making my approach because I got a nice wall. The students have their own lives and those of their crew at stake. Instructor Mark Davenport never lets them forget it. That's a hell of a way to start up the morning, huh? They got it. Hold on, swell on the bow. Try and get over that forward handrail. Get it over. Let's go. Off to each other. Handy, handy. Stand by. Good swell. Bring it back in. Bring it in. Swell forming on the bow. Hold on. about what's coming up here. But what ended up happening was you had to continually increase power to get yourself out of a bad situation. And all you did was accelerate a really bad thing. All right, we got lucky. We got lucky. All wings are aboard. We're talking about the ultimate team effort. One person drops out of the loop, one person can't perform, it falls apart. Everybody else on the boat is screaming, and rightfully so. Basically, they put their life in your hands. So you better make the right decision. We train and train and train constantly so that everything comes together when, when it gets ugly. You know? And that's when we perform the best, when things are absolutely the worst. I'd seen some seas, but nothing really, really big. And I, uh, I got on a boat. We went uh, out searching. It was like 18 to 20 foot seas. And I was standing on the side, and I looked up, and all I saw was water. And all that could come out of my mouth was big, 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 big wave. Little lifeboats will survive a complete rollover. But as Cape D executive officer Tom Dessette knows, it's an experience few crews want to repeat. A wave picked up to about 15 feet. I, uh, I did manage to tell everybody to hang on. I think they'd figured that out already. Wave slammed us. The next thing I knew, I was sitting upside down, and I was watching the windshield wiper going from side to side, going shh, shh. When the boat started coming back around, it was just an incredible feeling. The amount of water that's going past you as you make your transition. I pulled my helmet off. I was getting kicked in the head by somebody who was floating free on the port side. Uh, we came up, and my engineer was right here, and, and he was spitting out water and everything else. And uh, my crewman had seen all, what was happening, and he knew we were in trouble before anybody else. And he, he just looked at me and said, I can't believe you did that. Training and constant practice usually prevents a rollover, but self-writing boats are a modern luxury. They used to talk about the time when the ships were wood and men were steel, and uh, people who pulled the surf boats out with sweep oars out through the breakers have to fit that description. The Coast Guard here at Cape Disappointment started in 1878 because of the massive numbers of wrecks and lives lost they had here. More than 2,000 ships are known to have sunk along this coast. Unknown numbers of sailors lost. For ships in trouble, the very existence of the Coast Guard was often their only hope. The surfmen would patrol the beaches looking for wrecks or ships that had been driven aground. And it wouldn't be uncommon to patrol five or 10 miles up the beach, find a wreck, and have to walk all the way back to the Coast Guard station get the horses hooked up to the boat, run the boat back up, then out on the beach and row it out. It would take an incredible amount of stamina. Some of the wrecks are still visible at low tide, while others are just fading memories in local folklore along the shore of lost ships. And the Coast Guard at Cape D itself has lost more than 20 crew members over the years. Men and women, ready to put their own lives in danger in order to save lives. 
This is the heritage of Cape Disappointment. It's January, dead of winter. The bar's at its worst now, and the crews must deal with snow, ice, fog, and a freezing rain that can last for weeks. Coast Guard crews and their families live and work in such tough conditions just as they've done for more than a century. Today, one of them is having a birthday. Always a good excuse for a party. Yeah. Are you lying to me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For Sean and his crew, off duty for 48 hours, it's a chance to relax and let off steam. <laughs> there's definitely some camaraderie involved. When you're out on the boat, there's a coxswain, an engineer, and two crewmen. And you depend on each person to do something without hesitation, without question, because you hold the crew's life in your hand. <laughs> Each one of these guys that have been in for 10, 15 years, it's amazing how many people they've saved. But there's also a lot of them when they come home and they don't say anything. And you know it was a bad call, you know, especially when the husband gets up at night and keeps checking on the children. It's, it's scary sometimes. It's real scary. But you get used to when, the, when they're not home, you just go to bed. Mm -hmm. You sleep less. That's normal. You finally get your sleep pattern maybe down, you know. You just learn to live that way. It, it's not an easy way to live. It's really bad, like when I wake up in the middle of the night and know he's in trouble, and then he comes home and I'll say, you know, what happened? And he'll say, well, how do you know? It's just, you've been married for so long, you know they're in trouble sometimes. December 16th. 1991 is one of those bad calls. The 75-foot trawler Sea King issues a distress call. After a fierce beating from 20-foot seas and 40-mile-an-hour winds, she's taking on water faster than her pumps can handle. Cape D's boats are quickly on the scene, supported by helos and a larger buoy tender from Astoria. The Coast Guardsmen cross to the Sea King with extra pumps. They'll now do everything they can to help the skipper keep his vessel afloat. Despite all Coast Guard efforts, Sea King is still taking on water faster than the new pumps can handle. Then, without warning, she starts going down. Rapidly. Coast Guardsmen and three fishermen are still on board. The Sea King rolls over. Within seconds, Sea King is filling up with water. Four lives are saved, but one of the fishermen is injured. Chuck Sexton, a crewman from Cape D, tries to bring him out. Neither of them make it alive. The Sea King nosedives into 70 feet of water. A second fisherman, trapped in the engine room, is dragged down with the boat. His body is never recovered. I lost an employee on the Sea King, that went down on the bar. Uh, it was blowing pretty hard, and the, I guess the boat was taken on water, and I think. What I hear is he was down in the engine room trying to keep the engine running when the thing sunk, so he went down with the boat.
Chuck was an engineer I worked with uh, when I was an instructor at the Motor Lifeboat School. He was one of the engineers there, and I didn't know all the details then about what had happened. I did know that uh, he would have left a couple children behind, uh, and that sort of thing just really makes you think about your career choice. You know, we all know that there's risks in what we do, but when you lose somebody that you've been working with, it just makes it that much tougher. It's a small community, it's a small fishing community, and when anybody uh, dies out there, when, it, any, when there's any kind of fatality, it hits all of us. Things could happen so fast. The effect on the crew is devastating. We spend our lives, our every day at work, trying to do everything we can to make ourselves good at rescue work so that we can go out in conditions that most people don't want to go and do an effective job. When you have an accident like that, it cuts to the bone and it, it shows you just how mortal you are and it makes you that much more concerned about the next case coming up and what's going to happen. Despite the danger, despite the weather, and despite the periods of monotonous waiting between cases in winter, Cape Disappointment is one of the most popular and sought-after postings in the Coast Guard. I've been at other units, and this is a unit that had the reputation for going out in the rough stuff and saving a lot of people, so... Need Seaman Lovett and Petty Officer Allison? At quarters today, Lieutenant Greg Blanford, commanding officer of the station, will announce two promotions for Angie Lovett and Terry Allison. To all who shall see these presents greeting, know ye that reposing special trust and confidence in the fidelity and abilities of Terry Allison and Angela Lovett. the men and women of Cape Disappointment, another SAR, and another day doing what they do best, helping people get into trouble out on the Columbia River Bar. I think the job that we do to normal people isn't normal. When you actually do get to do a good rescue, uh, saving somebody's life, pulling them out of the water, spending five, six hours searching for a capsized boat, searching for people and finding them alive, that would be the, the most rewarding. Everybody is different. I'm a real loud and obnoxious person. Um, the next person could be a real quiet and shy person. I think everybody believes in their heart that they want to help people. They want to do a good job. They've saved a lot of lives and they've lost lives trying to save other lives. There's been a lot of times coming over the bar and I'll see those boats maneuvering around doing their practices and the breakers. And the bar will be crappy, but I look over and I see a Coast Guard boat there. I say, well, I feel a little bit better now. I know darn well they're looking after us. <laughs> <laughs> 